This is the Sons of UCF podcast, your place for UCF sports talk year-round. Now, here is Adam and Mike. Hey, what is going on, Night Nation? My name is Adam. Welcome into the Sunday Conversation, a new feature here from the Sons of UCF. We appreciate you taking some time to uh, to click play, and we hope you enjoy this. Let me set up for you what you're about to hear. Uh, so for many of you who've been following the Sons of UCF for a while, you may know a bit of our journey. We, uh, we had a bunch of interviews, a bunch of old shows that we had taped and that were out there on the internet under a different channel. And then we made a switch about a year ago to a new channel. And unfortunately, all those old conversations, uh, 97 episodes worth, were, uh, were lost. Uh, however, uh, although they weren't on the Internet or aren't on the Internet anymore, we still have the, uh, the master recordings. And so we still have the ability to, to listen to those when Mike and I want to. But that doesn't help you all. So we have been trying to figure out the best way to bring back some of these great conversations with your former knights because, uh, in our opinion, there are some really cool uh, interviews and it's a great opportunity to get to know some of the some of the folks who are black and gold um, and and the people that we've rooted for for all these years. So what we're doing tonight is we're going to bring you a Sunday conversation. We have two interviews that we're going to run that are part of kind of our throwback edition. So interviews that have already aired. So if, you, if you've been listening to us for a long time, you may have heard these before. But if you're new to the proceedings, these will be new conversations uh, to you. And either way, we think they're both great conversations and we think they'll both stand up and hold the test of time. Uh, and it'll be great to, to hear back some of the memories from some former nights. So that's what the Sunday conversation is. How often we're going to do this. Uh, and, and, and how and who, uh, all that will be decided later on. But we're excited at least to bring you this first edition of the, the Sunday Conversation. So for this episode, we have two interviews that we want to share with you. And how we came up with these interviews actually comes from the, uh, the latest edition of the Sons of UCF podcast. So for those of you who aren't following in real time, that's episode number 134. Mike and I do a segment called The Big Three where we talk about our big three of, certain, of a certain category. And this week's big three was our big three favorite interviews of all time. And Mike and I each picked three different interviews that uh, that we've enjoyed over time. And so tonight, we're going to play two of those interviews, one from Mike and one from, from my list, uh, for you to enjoy. The first will be from former UCF and NFL great uh, receiver Sean Jefferson. Uh, we spoke to Sean at episode number 85, so that was a, a, a quite a bit ago. And he recounts his UCF career and some of the early days of UCF. Um, and for those who maybe aren't familiar with Sean, he was really one of the first um, big name guys who went to the NFL and was representing UCF. He was, a, in some respects, a trailblazer in, in that regard. Uh, and so it was really cool to catch up with him. He's had a, he had a great UCF career. He had a great NFL career. Uh, and it's great to hear some of the early memories of what things were like in Orlando before uh, you know the, the glory days that we know of today. So you definitely enjoy the Sean Jefferson interview. After that, you're going to hear my selection, which was Taj McGowan. We had Taj on all the way back, episode number 33. Uh, so this would have been right after the uh, the 20, gosh, it had been 2018 season is when we had Taj on. And uh, I, I selected this interview just because I loved Taj's energy. Uh, you know, he had such great recollection of his time at UCF. And uh, this was really right off the heels of the famous play against Memphis, the uh, now we know is the let's go bone play which obviously Taj broke a 71-yard touchdown. And just hearing him recount that step-by-step step, uh, was just a, a great experience. His energy, his enthusiasm uh, was awesome. So two different conversations from two different eras of UCF sports. Uh, but Mike and I think you're going to enjoy both of these, uh, and uh, we hope that uh, we'll be able to bring you more and more of these conversations and more and more of our former interviews over the next com- uh, coming weeks and months as the summer goes on. But um, that's enough for me. Um, I'll get to the interviews now. Just do us one quick favor. If you're not following us on social media, make sure you find us at Sons UCF anywhere that you do social media stuff, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. You can also follow Mike at UCF Mike one. And don't forget about our live show. Sons UCF live coming every Thursday featuring Trace Trelco and our all new website, two nights media.com where you can find all of our merchandise that we're going to put up there at some point maybe and all the blog articles that maybe we say we're going to write you never really know but bookmark it early because at one point in time this thing will be uh, will be hopping so two nights media.com is where you can find all that stuff well that's enough for me let's hear from sean and jefferson
All right, we got a real special treat on the show. We've we've had a chance to cover a lot of really important eras of UCF football, but there's one era that we haven't had a ton of uh, of guests on. So happy that we're able to connect with uh, with our guest this evening and, and have him tell this story because it's it's quite a unique one. Uh, so we are, I mean, I'm beyond honored. I know Mike is as well to offer uh, offer up a, a UCF Hall of Famer and a 14 year NFL veteran, former UCF receiver Sean Jefferson is joining us on the show this week. Sean, uh, we appreciate you for taking some time to join us on the Sons of UCF podcast. Man, I really appreciate it. I thank you guys for having me. Uh, look forward to, uh, to having a good time tonight on the, on the talk show. That's that's what we're all about, man, is good times around here. But let's start with what turned out to be a good time for you, hopefully, is uh, the day you decided to commit to UCF. So, again, I want to paint the picture for everybody. You were there, what, what, 88 to 1990. So it's definitely not the UCF that maybe folks are familiar with today. Uh, so <laughs> yep. take us back to that. How did you end up at you committing to UCF? What was your recruitment process like? And, you know, how, uh, uh, how excited were you to become, a, a back then, I guess, a Golden Knight um, in 1988? Yeah, um, it was kind of kind of crazy because I didn't, I didn't play football until my 12th, my 12th grade year in high school, my senior year. And, and the only reason I went out, you know, to play football, there was a guy in my chemistry class telling everybody to come out, how he's going to be the star of the football team this year. And, you know, I just, I just said, and just, ah, oh, take your position and stuff like that. And he was like, you guys don't believe Sean. He's too scared to come out. And I was like, okay, the gauntlet has been thrown down now. <laughs> so I went out. <laughs> so I went out and I actually ended up starting over that guy. And I tell you what, ended up playing well and uh, got letters from University of Georgia, University of South Carolina, University of Liberty, and University of Central Florida. So I didn't know too much football at the time um, because I was still watching guys put their pads and stuff in their pants just to learn how to do all that stuff. So I figured at the time I had narrowed it down between Liberty and UCF. And the night before, uh, the guy who recruited me from UCF, his name was Coach Rick Stockstill. And so the night before uh, signing day, I called Coach Stockstill and was like, uh, I, I, I left a message on his phone. I'm like, I'm, I'm signed with Liberty uh, tomorrow because I was raised up in the church and Liberty was a Christian university. And the guy was like, hey, the recruiter was like, man, he did a job on me. He was like, hey, God is telling me he wants you here at Liberty, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> he, he did one on me. So, man, I was like, man, he's right. <laughs> so I called, I called Coach Stockstill, got his answer machine, like, Coach, I'm going to Liberty. And unbeknownst to me, okay, uh, Coach Coach Stockstill was calling me all that night. I would not answer the phone. My mom was my mother was like, Sean, you need to answer this phone. I, you don't. I know you do in your heart. You don't want to go to Liberty. I can tell, and stuff. And I would not answer Coach Rick Stockstill phone call. So unbeknownst to me, I get up the next morning, getting ready to go to the school to sign my you know scholarship for the University of Liberty, and I I walk out the front door. And I you got to understand, I didn't grow up in the best of neighborhood. So I walked in, I walked out the front door and I, I ran back in with Kirk and I'm like, mom, there's this white man that's sleeping in, in our front, in our front yard. And and then I went back in and then he knocks on the door. He's like, Hey, Miss Jefferson, Sean, I can't let you make that mistake. You need to be at UCF, man. I drove all the way down here, man, and come here and stuff. You need to be at UCF. So my, my, my mom, my mother was like, if this guy is brave enough to drive down here in this neighborhood, to come recruit you your butt better sign with him. And so that's how that happened. So it, it, it was awesome. It was an awesome recruiting trip. That's probably the best recruiting story we've, we've heard. We've heard a bunch, but never heard anybody sleeping on anybody's lawn. That's a, that's the first. So take us back. So again, I want to set the picture for everybody. Uh, again, you're there, 1988, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, people right. today think about you know the Spectrum Stadium and the Wayne Dench Center and the new Nutrition Center. But y'all didn't have yeah. any of that back in the day. Can you take us back to UCF facilities and just walking on campus in 1988 again? We weren't even D. Uh, we were we were still a Division two school at that point. We weren't even one double A just yet. Can you take us back to what what that was like and and paint the picture for the the program, the infrastructure that you uh, you found when you arrived on campus? Yeah, when I arrived on campus, it was maybe I don't know, maybe twelve buildings there. I mean, it was like grass and sand everywhere, and I, it looked more like a business park more than more than a college, to be honest, than a university more than anything. And so it, it was it was it was it was literally nothing. I mean, nothing there. The locker room we had was tiny. Uh, the football practice field was tiny. We played our games over at the Citrus Bowl, which which was awesome at the time, you know, but uh, uh, there was no training table, no dietitians. Uh, we had this, we had this card that we, we got. I used to go to this place called the Wild Pizza 
And that's why I used to, I lived on the Wild Pizza and 99 cent Big Macs from McDonald's when I was there. So we had no training tape or anything like that. Now I go back on the campus. I mean, it's like I have no idea how to find my way around the campus. It is just sprawling university to probably have the most, the most students, you know, in, uh, in university out of any university in, in the state of Florida. And it's just, it's just an awesome specimen to see. It's just so, it's just sprawling. The, the, the campus is unbelievable. The stadium, I stepped in that stadium for, for the first time. And I remember back when Gene McDowell and, and, and Coach Kruzik and all those guys were there. And it was like, one day we're going to have a campus, I mean, a stadium right here on this campus, man. And, and just to be a, be a part of the emphasis, uh, emphasis stages of UCF to going through all the Division II. Um, and, and, and back then when we was Division II, Coach McDowell, we played up a division. You know, we were Division Two, but we played like one double A. Like we used to play University of Memphis, so we had a hard schedule. So you know that's what UCF kind of bit his teeth on. That we didn't we didn't play to, play to the level of our competition. We played up a level. So I, I so 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 that 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 football program was built on that. When he you know he came there and started, he was a tough nosed coach. But uh, I'm just so glad to see to see the university and the state that it is today. One of the top universities in the United States, in my opinion, and then one of the best uh, sports programs, football programs there is in the, in, the, in the country who compete with anybody on even, any given Saturday. You guys mentioned how, how big we are now, but even back then, the fan base was still there because in 1998, you were ranked in the top five for the D2 schools. And it was a game where we drew over 30,000 fans against Troy State. That game yeah. is now known as the noise penalty game. What do you remember <laughs> about the atmosphere in the Citrus Bowl that night? I remember what I remember is that I could not hear anything in that stadium. That's what I remember most of all. Um, um, it was amazing, you know, just to just to be Division Two, but to uh, but to have thirty at least thirty thousand people in that to stand screaming and everything like that. And Troy State was our nemesis. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a drag down knockout and everything. But but the thing that I remember the most is the fan from the time the the first kickoff. To the last second run off that clock, I mean, they were viciously just shouting to the top of their voice, man. It was it was unreal, just an unreal experience. And and uh, a couple of years later, after that, we played um, uh, another uh, semifinal game against women, women Mary, I think it was. They were ranked number one or something like that in Division Two or something like that. And they had to come down to play us, man. And we whooped them. We whooped, we whooped them pretty good. We got them in that Citrus Bowl. And I tell them, we took them behind the shed and we spanked them and sent them back to women Mary with their tails tucked between their legs. And uh, unfortunately, the next week we had to run into a powerhouse, Georgia Southern. And we lost that. But, man, we had a good run. And, and uh, it was just a great experience. And that time that I spent at the uh, – at University of Central Florida, it, it, it prepared me once I got to, to the pro level for the competition part. I knew how to compete. I knew what discipline was. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have the best of facilities and everything like that. I learned how to make do with what I had and just to keep trucking. So once I got there, once I got to the, to, to the pros, man, my experience at UCF was, was valuable to me and, 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 and competing and helped, and helped me stay for, for, for 13 years in the NFL. Yeah, going back to that 88 season, like I said, we, were, we actually got it ranked as high as number two. Yeah, we lost. We lost the last four games of the season. What happened there at the end of the year? Did we suffer some injuries? What was going on? Remind everybody. There was a lot of injuries. There was a lot of injuries I, I can remember uh, uh, coming in, and, and a lot of a lot of backups had to step in, and everything like that. But um, I think a little bit too, a little bit of complacency as well set in a little bit, and, uh, and yeah, we lost. We we lost the last four, but. Uh, you know, but we had a, we had a good run, man. We had a good run, but we was a tough nosed team. Um, Coach McDowell stressed, you know, stressed team first, and we we were more like a family. Like I say, there was nothing at that camera, so all we had was each other, which I thought was a beautiful thing. To be honest with you. Well, by, uh, when '89 starts, you guys finished seven and three, uh, you, and like yeah. you said earlier, you had three wins that season over uh, one double A teams. Uh, so to your point, we we played up and, and we played well, uh, but the team didn't make the playoffs that year. How uh, I guess how frustrating, how disappointing was it that to, to put together a good season, have you know three pretty big wins, and, and not get a chance to make the playoffs that year? Yeah, it was it was pretty disheartening and everything, and 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 uh, but you know, like Coach McDonald always stressed that hey, look, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? We made our bed, we got to lie in it, and I think we came back that next year. And I think we ended up doing pretty well, and 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 uh, but but I tell you what, it was. Uh, just, you know, just just the whole experience that I had at UCL, Coach McDowell, Coach Kruzik, uh Coach Rick Stocksteel, and 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 for those guys to, to you know to carry that to, to be in the emphasis stage of that program and to to see what that program is today, it's just it's just amazing. I think that's and that's that's a commitment 
you know, to the to to the upper brass of University of Central Florida to, you know, to 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 their commitment to the football program and and and, and like I say, it's one of the finest programs in the country today. Well, you mentioned that next year, so that's nineteen ninety. Um and that's the year that UCF made the jump. So we made the jump to one double A. Um, yep. can, can you describe or explain to people as a student athlete, how important was it for you to, to be able to make that jump on the one double a level? And, and how important do you think it was for the school to, to finally get up to that one double a level in 1990? It, it was important because, it, because at that time to get up to one double a, we were like, uh, so to speak, we, we had, we had, we had sort of a ride when we make that jump and, you know, people, I guess the people knew that we was already playing. We was already playing a one double a schedule anyway, because McDowell, always played us up a level, you know, in, 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 in that regards. But to make that jump, it kind of like, it kind of like put UCF on the mat and say, okay, okay, hey, these guys, these guys are true contenders now. We better watch out for these guys, man. And ever since then, you know, UCF has just been building, building, building up to, to the football factor that it is today. Yeah, that 90 season, we actually started out four and three, but then we went on a six game winning streak. Yep. How did the team catch fire? You just guys just, Get a lot of chemistry there at the end of the year. Just got I, hot. What? I think so. I think we learned a lesson from years past. To be honest with you, you know what I'm saying. We learned a lesson from years past, and we just put it, we just put it together. And Coach Vidal will always preach to us, "Hey man, put your nose down and let's work." And one thing we were we were a tough team. We were a tough team, and we lost our we lost our share of games. But I tell you what, when those people when we played against opponents and stuff like that, I'm telling you, they they walked away saying, "Wow." Okay, this team is something else. I tell you, we was a tough team. And I think our overall willingness to, to, to sacrifice and put our own individual goals to the side and to put the team first, that was a turnaround in that season right there. Dude, that was a turnaround in that season. And, and I tell you what, that was, a, that was a hell of a season we put together that year. Like I say, when Mary comes in, and, I mean, we smacked them. I mean, that's, that's, that's my most vivid memory right there because, I, you know, leading up to that game, all the reports like, man, how in the world are we going to keep up with William and Mary? They had the number one score in offense, you know, in, 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 at the time in the league. And, and we were, you know, the reports like, UCF don't have a chance. But we knew they was coming to that Citra Bowl. So we knew we were a tough team. So Coach McDowell was always saying, hey, let's just get them in a fight. This team has never been in a fight before. Let's put them in a fight. We've been in our share of fights. Let's get this team in a fight, fight, and let's see how they go. And we, man, from the jump, we jumped all over them, and they, they really did not know what in the hell hit them. They did not. Before they, before they knew what, just kind of figured out what was going on, the last, last few seconds running off that clock. And we sent them way on back to women, Maryland, long, long playing ride back. <laughs> <laughs> you had a game earlier that season. You only had three catches, but you had 135 yards against Southern Illinois. Yes, I remember that game. What, did you have? A, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Did you have a bunch of? I mean, obviously, they were long passes, but were they bombs or were you just lots of running after the catch? What, what kind of passes were? They? I think the first, the first one was a, a, a slant route that I took to the house, and then I think Sean Beckton probably threw me a reverse pass and, 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 and stuff like that. And one more pass. I, I tell you what, after the game, I had no idea. And my coach at the time was coach Robert, Robert X. And he comes to me like, Hey man, you had a hundred and fifty something yards on three catches. I'm like, what? You know? And I was like, at the time I was like, okay, man, well maybe, well maybe I can do a little something in football, but it, it, it was, it was, it was awesome, man. I mean, the way that, that, the, the offense was constructed, man. Coach Coach McDowell would, would use because we we had some speed, and he understood, you know, that hey, if, if that team didn't have enough team speed, that we're gonna run them out, run them off the field. And, and uh, I think that was probably one of my biggest games I've, I I had uh, at my career at UCF, probably against Southern Illinois. Well, you mentioned uh, the William and Mary game a few times, but uh, I want to remind folks, we don't get to that game. If we don't win uh, of our first ever road playoff game on the road, we're playing Youngstown State with no time on the clock. Uh, our guy, Franco Grilla, uh, drills a 34-yard field goal to send us on to, to round two. Uh, can, you, can you take us back to that kick on the field? Or, I know it's always going to be stressful, right, when, when the kickers trots out. Uh, what are your memories yeah. of that game and, and kind of uh, you're waiting for, uh, for Franco to, to fire that 34-yarder through? My first thought when he was getting ready to go out and kick that field goal, I'm like, hey, Franco, you better make this damn kick because it's cold as hell in no time. <laughs> it was absolutely freezing. But, you know, to have a, you know, take a Florida team, come from the sunshine and go up there in Youngstown, hold out, and it was brutally cold up there. I mean, that was my first time I ever, like, really been in weather like that, inclement re- weather like that. But, man, Franco, to be honest with you, man, he was kicking, kicking the hell out of that ball the whole year, coming up with 
kick field goals and stuff like that, keep us in the game the whole year. So he tried it out to make that kick. I, I, the first thing went to my mind, you better make this because I'm ready to get on. I'm ready to get back to the locker room, get on this bus, get the hell out of Youngstown State. And when he made that kick, that sideline absolutely exploded. We exploded. And again, it was kind of been, it was kind of it was kind of like stamped. Okay, we belong here. We belong here. We took that momentum and, and ride it on to get to that game. But it, it was an awesome feeling. Uh, uh, he walked out. I think it was like, if I'm not mistaken, it was like a 40 or 50 yard kick, wasn't it? Uh, 34 yards. Uh, 34 yards. Even better. But he had made some. He had made some unbelievable uh, uh, field goals for us throughout throughout the season. And I'm surprised. Like like to be honest with you, I thought I thought to be honest with you, that he would he would have a long career in the NFL. To be honest with you, that that was my feeling. Well, that team, like you, met, like you mentioned, went all the way uh, and, and unfortunately lost in the end, but finished 10-4 and four, at that point was the best record in UCF history. But there was a lot of talent on that team. You mentioned uh, yourself, obviously, but you also mentioned another name. Uh, you had a chance to play with Sean Becton, another guy who was uh, uh, synonymous with, with UCF football and had a, a hell of a playing career and, and UCF Hall of Famer and you know, spent some time in the coaching staff a few different times. What was it like playing with, uh, with Sean Becton back then? For those who didn't get to see him play and only know him as a coach, uh, he had a pretty good career as well. You guys had to make a pretty good one-two punch back in the day, huh? Yeah, it was awesome. To be honest with you, I credit Sean Becton uh, for me becoming a, a, a pretty good receiver. Um, when I first came to, to University of Florida, like I said, I was young in the football game. And so what I did, I would watch him in practice. He was such – he was – I tell people all the time, he's the best route runner I've ever seen in my life besides Jerry Rice. Mm -hmm. And this is no joke. I tell people that all the time. And what I did, I did not know, you know, because I was young in the football at the time, so I did not know how to run routes. Obviously, Beck, Beck had played a long time coming up through through Pop 1 and all that stuff like that. So what I would do, I would every time he would run a route, I would go after him and we was, like, throwing with the quarterback, and I would mimic to the T the same route that he would run. That's how I learned how to run, run routes, through him. Through him, and I tell people all the time, I'm, and this is the truth, he is the reason I became the receiver I had because I saw I saw the discipline he had, okay, with running routes. You know, I saw the patience that he had. You know, what I'm saying of getting open. You know, and also I saw the, the, the you know the, the hand eye coordination, the, how he would stay out the practice and catch on the jugs, catch on the jugs. So I saw the work he put in. So he he was the reason, to be honest with you, that he's the guy that I credit for me becoming a pretty good receiver and, and going on to the NFL and was able to, to, you know, to play a couple of years there. But it was awesome playing with him. I mean, he would throw me reverse passes. And you're talking about an unselfish guy and, and everything like that. And I used to ask him, like, man, how do you run routes like that? Because I, I could never do it. But what I did, I mimicked him the whole way and stuff. And that guy was incredible. To me, he's the best receiver in UCF history. That's, that's, now, I'm not just saying that because I, I played with him. I'm saying that because of the type of person he is. And I know what type of unselfishness, you know, that he played with. And, and, and he's just a, he's just an unbelievable person. And, and, and uh, he's, he's the best receiver, in my opinion, in UCF history, bar none. I don't care what the stats are or anything like that. I know the complete receiver. He's the most complete receiver in UCF history. Yeah, how often did you guys argue over the proper way to spell Sean? Because you, you spell it <laughs> different ways. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. I, 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 I'll be honest with you. I thought everybody's name was spelled S H A W N. To be honest with you, but he's the first guy. He's the first guy. I was like, "Hey, how you spell your name?" He's like, S E. I'm like, "Seen?" No, he's like, "Sean." Like, <laughs> but it, it was it was it was awesome playing alongside him, and and uh, we we had a good time playing together. Matter of fact, we're best friends. I I talk to him. I talk to him all the time. I talk to him at least once, twice a week. Nice. So over the years now, and a lot of fans listening to this are probably more recent UCF fans, we've had different types of head coaches. We had O'Leary. He's a tough disciplinarian. That He's mostly a defensive guy. And now the last couple, we've had Frost and Heupel. They're more players' coaches, and they love to air it out. They're offensive-minded guys, fast-paced offenses. Take yeah. us back to your guy. How would you describe Gene McDowell? He was three yards in a cloud of dust. I'll tell you that right now. We had uh, Perry Belaces. Uh, uh, we had another back, Willie, uh, forget his name. Uh, but, man, I'll tell you what, we ran that ball. Uh, uh, I think we got another. Uh, we used to call him Italian Stallion. He's running back Giacone. Yeah. Uh, that was his name. Oh, my God. You're talking about a great back. You're talking about hard nose. He was the Rocky Bell boy, man, of the running backs, big time, man. So, so we were gonna run the ball, man. Like I say, we were we were a tough team, and we were if you couldn't stop our run, we was gonna run down your throat the whole time. You know what I'm saying? So, so we was three yards in a cloud of dust, but but you know, you know, uh, coach, 
Coach Cruz, he can say every now and then, he'd be like, okay, enough of this run. Let's try to, hey, we got two good receivers. Let's air this thing out. So, but it's, it's, it's just, it's just amazing to see how, you know, how football has changed back then, you know what I'm saying? It was more of a three yards in a cloud of dust. And now to see what UCF is doing now. I mean, they are like putting up unbelievable numbers on the offensive side of the ball. It's absolutely just crazy. It's, it's fun watching them. It's absolutely fun watching them. You also had Kruzek, you said, was he the offensive coordinator of the years you were there? Yes, he was offensive coordinator year year that I was there. You know, formal uh, Pittsburgh still a quarterback, so he knew how to throw the ball. And he knew how to how to manipulate defenses in order to get them in the coverage that we wanted to get into them in order to throw the ball. So, and I, I so I think that's a big part of why Sean and Sean Beck and I was so successful. What was it like playing the Citrus Bowl in the late '80s? Because I remember Adam and I were there. It was '98 to 2002. I remember there was troughs in the bathroom. The stadium's kind of old. I know it's gone through renovations now. <laughs> what was it like in those years back in 88, 89, 90? You know, to be honest with you, I, I thought it was the greatest thing in the world, man, because, you know, we didn't have we have a stadium on campus, man. So I used to watch all these other games on TV at these other colleges playing in a big, you know, big old stadium. So I, I, I thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread, to be honest with you. I, I didn't really even notice that. I'm like, I'm just – I'm just happy to be in a big bowl game. And, and we had our share of fans. We didn't pack the stadium. But, man, I'll tell you what, UCF fans, man, they were they were, they were were lawyered then. And, I, and obviously, they're lawyered now, man. We, we They showed up for UCF football in good numbers. They really did. You were a ninth-round pick in, uh, in 1991 uh, into the NFL. Mm-hmm. I think you went to Houston. Uh, how, how cool was that? How cool was that dream for you to kind of realize and, and hear your name called and, and get a chance to, uh, to embark on what turned out to be a pretty long NFL career? Yeah, it was kind of it was it was kind of like uh, it was kind of surreal. Like you know, I remember when uh, I picked up the phone and said, "Hey, Sean Jefferson." I said, "Yes, this is uh, the Houston Oilers. We just drafted you in the ninth round." I was like, and you know, to be honest with you, he told me that my first response is, "You got the damn best receiver in the draft." <laughs> and he's like, he kind of he, and to be honest with you, he chuckled. He's like, "Okay, yeah." I was like, "No, you got the best receiver in the draft." I'm telling you. I say, "Listen, listen, I got my clothes packed now. I can be on a plane to come tonight." He's like, "Hey." Just wait a minute. <laughs> the NCAA don't allow us. You got to wait to Benny camp and all like that. But that was my mindset. You know what I'm saying? That was my mindset. I kind of felt like, to be honest with you, I kind of felt like there were some receivers, you know, that, that actually went before me, whether they went to big time school or not, that went before me that I thought that I was better than. And to be honest with you, out of all the receivers that got drafted in that class in 1991, I outlasted every one of those receivers that got drafted in a class. I, I think all except one. I outlasted all of them. Late more reasons, all of them. But uh, but it, it was kind of surreal. It was kind of surreal moment to hear my name being called and to get to training camp and 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 uh, see guys like Warren Moon and these guys you grew up watching on television. You're like, oh man, this is real stuff now. And to get there and have to go, have to go to compete. And just like I say, you know, you know, going to UCF and with Gene McDowell, man, you know, when I went to those camps, man, I knew what it was to compete. I knew what it was to to, to stand my ground and not back down. And I think. I think early on during the training camp, I think that would kind of stuck out with some of the coaches there. We kind of how I held my own, and I was I, and I was tough. You know, I, you know, I had to fight and claw my way the whole time. You know, as a ninth round draft pick, you know, that's kind of that's a late draft pick, and you know, you probably not expected to make it. But um, early on in camp, man, I kind of like uh, kind of caught the caught, caught the eye of some coaches there, and then I was able to stick and uh, volunteer for some special teams and and, and stuff like that. And was able to play some special teams, so. I cut my teeth on that man, and and uh, we went to um, play San Diego in a, uh, in a in a preseason game. But before that, we we we, were, we went out there a week and scrimmaged with them. So all during that week, I remember I was having good practices and stuff like that. During the, when the game came on Saturday, I crushed it. I had like two touchdowns in the game. I played well, had a good practice all that week, competing against those guys. And we got back to we won the game. We got back to uh, Houston. And and uh, late that night, and then I wake up the next morning. I'm I'm sitting at the break. I'm sitting at the lunch table, at uh, breakfast table, just having some eggs and sausage. And I get tapped on the back of my shoulder by an operations guy, and he's like, "Hey, look, your uh, your services are wanted in San Diego." And I kid you not, within an hour, I was I was on a plane headed to San Diego. They traded me for a Pro Bowl defensive lineman named Lee Williams, and I was just a old ninth round draft pick. So I went there. <laughs> It worked out. It worked out well. You know, it worked out well for me. It really did. It sure did. And you actually became a, kind of a trailblazer. You were one of the first, if not the first, receiver out of UCF to to make it in the NFL. And 
And since then, we've had a slew of guys. I don't, you know, I don't know how, how much the common fan realizes that, but we've had a slew of guys who have come in the league at the receiver position. Brandon Marshall, Mike Sims Walker, yes. you know, Brashad yes. Perryman, Doug Gabriel. Yes. We got Traquan Smith there now. Gabe Davis just got drafted. Uh, how yes. cool is it to see all these wide receivers coming out of UCF kind of following in your footsteps? And how much pride uh, do you kind of take knowing that you're one of the, the first guys to, uh, to get in the NFL wearing the, you know, wearing the UCF uniform? It, it, it's, it's an awesome feeling, man. But I'm telling you right, right now, um, I'm not surprised by the receivers and the players that UCF is producing, you know, coming into the NFL now. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not surprised. Again, that started way back, you know, with, you know, with, when I got there, you know, we were playing up a level, you know, uh, we didn't care who the school was. We played Universal Memphis. We didn't care. So, so those guys, you know, coming out of UCF, man, we're, we're, we're well, we're, we're, we're hardened. We're, we're battle tested. You know what I'm saying? It's, and, and it doesn't, doesn't surprise me. I was just, I was happy to be one of the first receivers from UCF to, to kind of make it, you know, and, and really Bernard Ford, a guy who played before me uh, in the NFL, he kind of paved the way for all of us. So, so it doesn't surprise me, you know, the, the, the guys that UCF is producing from a skill position uh, been in the NFL now, and just goes to show you how old I am. I'm now going to be coaching uh, Perriman. Yeah. You know, we signed him. He was the Jets now. So it's a small world, it's a small world. Yeah, you were inducted to the UCF Hall of Fame in 2002. Who gave you that phone call, and how honored were you when you finally got that call? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. I think it was Coach Mike Krusek. You know, tell me I've been inducted into the UCF Hall of Fame, and I was like, man, it was. It was like I, I tell you what. That you know, besides you know being drafted and the birth of my kids, that's one of the most proud moments. You know what I'm saying? Of of of, of my life, to be honest with you, because I could care of my son back. Be like, hey, look, here's your dad. You're hanging in the rafters. You know, at UCF, that was a proud moment. And to be honest with you, man, you know, the credit belongs to Sean Beckton. Beckton taught me how to be a receiver. He really did. So so after I got the call from Coach Kruzek, Sean Beckton called me. And I also told me, and I thanked him. I said, Sean, this is because of you, man. You taught me how to play the receiver position. You know, I didn't know, didn't know the first thing about running a route. But, yeah, you know, he'd stay after. He'd help me. And, and, and he showed me how to do this and do that. So, so, so it was a real credit to him, to be honest with you, you know, to, 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 to receive, you know, to receive that honor, man. And it's just awesome, man. Like I always, you know, have a place, you know, always be in the books there, you know, with some kid long years from now saying, okay, who is this guy? Then maybe look me up and like, okay, Sean Jefferson. Hey, let's see what this kid is about. And that, that's what it is. I get a chance to see my grandkids, get a chance to come to a game and, and let my grandkids see my, 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 uh, my name hanging in the rafters. So that, that's a big honor. Sean, you mentioned you're, you're still close with, uh, with Sean Beckton. Do you think there's ever a chance we get him back at UCF? I know he, he flew to the Nebraska cold weather. Do you think there's ever a chance we get him back to, to UCF at some point before his career is over? He, yeah, you know, Sean Beckton is a knight at heart. You know what I'm saying? And, and uh, I talk to Sean Beckton, uh, you know, all the time. And, and, you know, to be honest with you, I would love to see Sean Beckton be the head coach of UCF. Yeah. I, I really do. I think, you know, I mean, he's a, he's a UCF. When you talk about a guys who, who's a trendsetter, you know, when you talk about UCF, you know, football and, you know, that's him. His, 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 his name and his face is tied with that forever. And I, I do think he's a damn good coach. He's a damn good recruiter. And I do think, man, I would, I would love to see, you know, him, you know, come back and finish career off as being the head coach of UCF at some point. And you mentioned that you now are coaching you with the Jets. Is that yeah. something you thought you always wanted to do after you played? You always wanted to get in coaching, or just that something that kind of popped up afterwards? You know what? It kind of popped up. You know, I, I tell you what. After I finished playing, I had really, really no aspirations of of of, of being an NFL coach. But but uh, you never know um, um, when you're out there on the field and when you're out there practicing and how you carry yourself as a pro. You never know who's watching you. So I'm sitting at home after I retired in my last and final year. I played with Detroit. Um, and the head coach was Coach Mario Uchin, my last and final 13 years. So my last and final 13 years, I was I was really a coach. I was a player, but I was really more of a coach player my last and final 13th year. You know, 13 years, you, you know, Mother Nature's little, taking a little bit from you <laughs> and stuff. But, you know, so I was really more, you know, helping the young guys come along, teaching them how to, you know, how to play the game, the little nuances of the game. And unbeknownst to me, Coach Mario Uchin was watching me the whole time. I did not know. You know, did not know. So I'm sitting home one day and, you know, one day in June, you know, just sitting home, not doing anything. I get a phone call and I'm like, man, who is this? So I didn't I didn't know who it was. So I just answered. I was like, hello. And phone. The guy comes across, says, uh, Sean Jefferson. I say, yeah, who is this? He said, this is Coach Marucci. I was like, yeah, Coach, what are you calling me for? <laughs> I really did. He said, listen, 
we drafted some young receivers, and I know you probably didn't know this, but I watched you your whole your whole year here. You played for me, man, and I had the whole time thinking, man, this guy will make a great coach. So I would like to invite you to come to training camp, you know, to kind of mentor these young receivers, teach them what it is, how to study, what it is to be a pro and stuff like that. And I had no aspirations. He said, well, just come for two weeks, you know, and, 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 and uh, just come for two weeks and, you know, teach the guys, and then after that you head back. So I did. I went for two weeks. So after two weeks in, he's like, hey, you think your wife will let you stay another week? I'm like, yeah, coach, no no big deal. I'll stay another week and stuff like that. So after that week was up, he's like, uh, how about staying through the whole training camp? I'm like, yeah, coach, no big deal. No big deal. I'll stay through the whole camp. And after that, he was like, ah, what do you think about doing a four-year intern? <laughs> and so that's how I did. I did a four-year intern. They put me in a corporate apartment. They paid me 300 bucks a week. You know what I'm saying? And then after that, I was just basically learning. I learned how to break down film and everything like that. Then after the season ended, they offered me they offered me a quality control job, and and that's how it started. And, and it goes to show you, I, I that's how that's how it that's how it started. And 15 years later, I'm still coaching. So I, it's been a it's been an unbelievable uh, journey for me. And 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 uh, you know, and I tell kids all the time, man, just make sure you put your best foot forward because you never know you never know who's watching. So make sure it's your best at at, at all times. You really enjoy the NFL? Do you think there's part of you maybe one day wants to come back to college and maybe coach with Beckton, get back on the sidelines in Orlando? I tell you, I tell you what, I enjoy coaching coaching on the pro level. I can tell you this: if Beck ever gets a job down at UCF, I'm, I'm I'll be the first one. <laughs> I'll be on the first bird, on the first plane headed down there to, to 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 coach for free for him. I really would, man. I really would. I, I got so much to to give back to the guy who really taught me how to play that position. Well, you're a, you're a legend in your own right, so uh, uh, and we appreciate you taking some time. And, and, and what we do around here, Sean, is we end every interview with uh, what we call kind of a random rapid-fire question. So we're going to ask you a yeah. bunch of questions. It could be about anything. It could be music, movies, sports, food. You never know what you're going to get. So are you prepared okay, cool. Are you prepared for some rapid-fire questions? I am so ready. Let's, let's roll them. All right. You, you, you mentioned that you had a, a pretty long NFL career. You played uh, uh, with a lot of great quarterbacks. Which quarterback did right. you play with that threw the hardest ball, the ball that like almost broke a finger or, or busted your gloves up? Who threw the hardest ball? Damn Michael Vick, man. That guy had a damn cannon. <laughs> he was so, five. I didn't care whether he's five yards away or 50 yards away. It was coming on a rope. So Michael Vick, it was, it was, it was, I mean, he was a lefty. He was a lefty too. So, I mean, it was a different rotation on the ball, but, I mean, good. That was no touch, man. It was a bazooka. The, it was a bazooka the whole freaking way coming at you. As a receiver, is it cool for you to be like, hey, don't throw so hard? Like, what do you what do you do in that situation? Yeah, I, I, I really couldn't kind of say that because that's kind of <laughs> yeah. like coming out. Like, that's kind of like saying, hey, don't throw me the ball, but I want the ball. So, I just had to, I just had to, I just had to, I just had to take it. But, I mean, he was a phenomenal athlete now. I mean, he, 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 he kind of changed the game at the quarterback position at the time. Uh, coming into the league, but I mean, he he had a cannon on it. And I'm telling you what, it came it it came in hot every freaking throw. You've had the chance to travel all over the country over your career. What's your favorite city to visit in America? Oh gosh, Boston, Massachusetts. Boston, Massachusetts, man, I really do with the history up there, uh, and they, they their love for sports. You know what I'm saying? And, and the outdoor, I tell you what, me being a guy from the South, when I went to play up there in, in, in New England, with, I mean, in Boston, I had never seen when autumn time come and the changes of the, the colors of the leaves and stuff like that. So it was just, I thought that was the most beautiful sight in the world when autumn rolled around and got to see the changes of the season and everything like that. So that, that, that would be the, be my favorite city. You know, I got a chance to go, you know, sit in there and see the Red Sox play at the Green Monster. So that to me, that that that's my favorite city. You retired from the NFL, I think, in two thousand three, right? Absolutely. So how? Uh, yeah. So if if you time that up with UCF, we had some good years in the in the late nineties with Dante. But uh, how how long did it take, or how many times did you have to explain to people when they asked you where you went to school? How often did you have to explain what UCF stood for, or what UCF was? Hey, you know what? I used to get pissed about that because when I was like, who you play for? University of Florida. Oh, Florida Gators? I'm like, hell no. University of Florida. I'm a knight. I'm like, like at the time, you know, that's the only college they knew. I mean, no, university they knew in the state of Florida was University of Florida or Florida State. I was like, no. I went to the best university there. It was the University of Central Florida. And they would laugh. Like, I'm like, no. I'm like, University of Central Florida. I'm a knight. Kill. I'm a knight. <laughs> <So> <laughs> So did you have any influence on your son? Because he ended up going to Florida. You didn't try to say, hey, you know, what are you doing? We got UCF right here, right in our backyard. You know, you know, man, like, I I, I, I kind of 
trying to push him toward UCF. But you know how kids, my son was like, ah, oh, dad, I kind of want to blaze my own paths. I'm like, hey, I, I totally get it. I totally get it. So, so you know, I was trying to push UCF on it. But my son was type deal. Like, he, you know, my son, like, uh, one of his thing is he doesn't want to live in the shadow of his dad. And, and, and uh, I totally understand it. So, I get, you know, I was told him, hey, you know, go where you want to go. If it's all I do is try to give him some friendly advice. And you know how kids are. Sometimes coming up, they don't listen. You know what I'm saying? And then, then, then they have to go out on their own for a change. And when they come back, then they want to listen. But, you know, he was a guy that, uh, you know, wanted to, wanted to blaze his own path. So you kind of have to let him do it. You know what I'm saying? They have to experience life that way. Yeah. All right. Well, getting back to the other fun questions. Growing up in the 80s, were you a guy? Were you a Michael Jackson guy or a Prince guy? Beat it! Beat it! <laughs> <laughs> I was a both for sure, Michael Jackson guy, man. I tell you what, to be honest with you guys, you guys didn't know, but in high school, I had the Jerry curl like Michael Jackson and everything like that. He's like, I hate, he's like <laughs> <laughs> I know I hate to say that, uh, but I did. I had the Derrick curls, everything like Michael Jackson. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, but uh, man, he was he was he was definitely the best entertainment entertainer I've ever seen in my life, big time. I was definitely a Michael Jackson fan. Well, you, when you were in the NFL, it was a much different league. Obviously, a much more physical league, um, especially on on the outside. Which defensive right. back uh, talked the most trash to you uh, in your time in the NFL? That damn Deion Sanders, man. <laughs> I, I, I tell you what, and the thing about it. He could back it up. Now, I was a pretty, pretty fast receiver, but man, I tell you what, man, on my fastest day, he was even faster, man. He'd be like, "Hey, there's gonna be no catches over here today, so let's let's get it on." I'm just telling you now, man. He would talk so much trash that I couldn't wait, you know, for a run play. I was just on a run play. I just run fast as I could, just try to smack him, man. I mean, he was he was unbelievable. He was the worst, one of the best trash talkers, and and but he did he he backed it up. I mean, and like you say, during that time. We played. It was we played a physical brand of uh, football then. But I tell you what, you know, a lot of people don't give Dion credit. You know what I'm saying for his physicality. But every time I played him, I'm telling you right now, it was a physical. It was a physical battle going up against him. You had to work for everything you got. I mean, he was one of the best, best DBs I ever played against. And then uh, he deservedly, uh, uh, he deserved that gold jacket that he wears. You know that he's now in the Hall of Fame for sure. All right, what's the funniest movie of all time? I would say next Friday. I was second one Friday. What? Friday after next. Yeah, probably Friday after next. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, I, I, I would say that one. I watched that one. Uh, I don't know if you know this one character in there called Pinky. You know, there's this one scene where I guess Ice Cube, you know, he thought Ice Cube was trying to uh, uh, steal the store and they got in a fight and it was just hilarious, man. I think that that was <laughs> Friday after next. Friday after next. And my character in that would be called Pinky. I mean, just hilarious. <laughs> What's uh? You mentioned you have kids. You mentioned uh, your, your son. What's one thing that you do that still embarrasses your kids? I think now, now it is is that the, me trying to get out on the field and run a route to show him, you know, how to run a route, and it's, it's you know, he he literally like laughs at me, like <laughs> you know, mother. I'm, and I'm 51 years old now, so I don't have a lot of a lot of a lot of pop in my heart now a little, little bit. You know what I'm saying? I try to get. He like, hey, dad, just relax. Just not, I cringe. He like, hey, dad, just like, can you show me on film? I'm like, no, no. I, I, I at, a, at a time important in my life, I did this, you know. So that that's kind of embarrassing. He kind of embarrassing when I go to the field with him and try to try to try to mimic a route and show him how to run a route. He's like, man, dad, let's just let's just go back and watch it on film. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what was your favorite hangout spot while you were at UCF? Did you go downtown, or was there a local spot close to campus that you guys always went to? Well, that was a wild pizza. It was a wild pizza. It was a wild pizza. That restaurant right there. I mean, the, the pizza was good. You know what I'm saying? And 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 and, and the beer was always cold. That was, that's my favorite thing out. <laughs> you can't beat those two things. I mean, that, that sounds like a fact. Exactly. Uh, all right, so you mentioned your son Van. By the way, congratulations, second round pick uh, in the draft this season. Thank you. Uh, Thank he you so uh, he went to University of Florida. Uh, there's a lot yeah. of uh, good fun banter back and forth between UCF fans and Florida flan- fans these days about who's the best school. I want to ask you to pick that because I know you probably got some allegiance on both sides. But let me ask you this. There was some talk allegedly that uh, you know Florida would only play UCF if it was a two for one, meaning we go to Gainesville twice, they come to Orlando once, and they didn't even want to come on campus. Do you think right. the Gators should schedule a one for one, a home and home series with UCF? Absolutely, I do. Absolutely, I do. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm telling you right now. Now, I'm telling you right now. They pro- the University of Florida probably don't want to do that. I promise you, they don't want to do that. They don't want to do that. And I have no allegiance. You know, I know my son went there and stuff. And, you know, 
But I'm just telling you right now, I don't think Florida Gators want any part of the night, especially with that offense they run now. I don't think they want any part of that. That's just my opinion. I, I agree. agree with you. I agree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. So you're in New York now, and you just mentioned how much you love pizza. Do you have a favorite pizza spot up there? Yeah, it's called Mona's. It's called Mona's. <laughs> yeah. It's a, a classic New York style pizza, uh, kind of thin crust. I like the margarita. I like the margarita pizza. And, and I'll tell you what, every time I go get, I get a large. And so you get about like 10 pieces of stuff like that. And, and uh, I can eat it. I can eat, I can eat eight before I start feeling, feeling pretty full, but it's called Mona's. I'm telling you, it is unbelievable pizza. Uh, the cheese and the, the sauce, you can taste the basil in that sauce and the cheese is just melted just right. It's like unbelievable. I'm sorry, guys. I'm getting hungry right now. Yeah. Talking about no, on that, on that, <laughs> yeah, on that note, you've, you've made me hungry too. So uh, maybe we should, uh, we should wrap it up. But no, Sean, it's been a real treat. I can't thank you enough for coming on and, and giving us some insight back on the kind of the early days of UCF. And obviously uh, it, it's great to hear how, how proud you still are of the school all these years later and, oh, yeah. and all the support you have for UCF, man. So we appreciate you for coming on and uh, wish you best of this upcoming season hopefully everybody's safe and, and healthy and and we get an nfl season kicked off this year and uh you know we wish you the, the best as, as you get to coaching and hopefully one day we'll get you back down to orlando and get you back in the black and gold absolutely guys thank you guys for having me and go knights All right, our next guest uh, spent four years in uh, in UCF and uh, was in the backfield for his entire four years. So he saw a lot, three different staffs, and uh, he saw the ups and downs. And uh, overall, uh, this guy was really solid and, uh, you know, one of the cornerstones of all the uh, success UCF had. So I'm really excited to welcome in Taj McGowan to the show. Taj, man, thanks for joining us tonight, man. How are you? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. No, man, we appreciate you, and uh, we appreciate everything you did for UCF, but let's start off at the beginning really quickly. So um, you came to UCF in 2015 out of Broward County. Mike and I are also both from Broward County, so uh, so we definitely uh, respect the 954. Uh, so obviously, <laughs> uh, obviously UCF was close to you in proximity, um, but what made you decide UCF uh, as, a, as a college choice? Was, was the Fiesta Bowl win a, a part of it, or I guess what made you de- de- decide to come to Orlando for your college career? The crazy thing is, um, when when UCF first started looking at me, um, there were two key things that really intrigued me. The first one was obviously the close, close proximity to being home, so I knew it would be really easy for my family to watch me play. And the second thing was that year they only were, they were only taking one running back, and that just and for them to want it to be me, it just made me feel really special, and it showed how much I I thought they cared about me. So that that was those are the two main reasons I, I came to UCF. So you you were the only running back recruit that year? Yes, sir. I was the only one. That's awesome. Who was your uh, Who was your main recruiter? Who was the the guy who was uh, uh, who was down there spending time with you? Danny Barrett. Okay. Coach Barrett was going. Yeah, I talked to him a lot. Cool. All right. Well, it's not our favorite subject either. The first season, 2015, your freshman year, you know, it didn't go well. Obviously, right. but you saw a lot of playing time that year. Yeah. Right. I think you actually had the most carries in your career. 85 right. carries that year right so mm-hmm. what was that experience like as a freshman uh it was it wasn't the most ideal experience <laughs> you would want but i mean it was definitely eye-opening man it just it just um because coming out of high school i had a, my team from high school was doing really good so to go from a really good team to just like a very bad year it just it, it was it was strange it felt it felt weird and um just the vibe from the whole team was wasn't wasn't where it needed to be. So it was it was kind of a you got to grow up fast type of deal where like you you, you never want to go through that again. Yeah, well, twenty sixteen came around obviously, Taj, and and uh, we saw a bunch of changes, right? So new staff mm-hmm. came in, obviously a new system. Um, some new guys came in, obviously some other guys graduated. Uh, but you were still kind of a young player, obviously just coming in as a as a sophomore at that point. Uh, for you, what was the big adju- biggest adjustment going from that 2015 season and that 2015 staff to the 2016 season and, and the new staff overall? Um, the biggest adjustment was I, the one I would say was obviously um, just the whole the whole scheme change with O'Leary. It was it was power eye down your throat and your face. Um, but and then when Coach Frost got here, it, it flipped to spread. 
Like now you got it. Now the running backs got to know how to play receiver. And now it's like dynamic speed. Everybody's fast. It was like night and day from what, from what I came in with. And it was, that was the most, that was the hardest thing I would have to say. Just, just switching that whole dynamic from a full power offense. So, which was what I was used to in high school as well to basically everything is spread scheme that that was the that was the hardest for me to be honest with you how, how long did it take you before you got comfortable right so how i know you obviously you guys went through spring practice and then fall practice and obviously into the season how, when was there a time where you find like okay i got it i understand the system now and you actually felt comfortable um uh midway through fall camp you know i felt i felt i felt like everything started started to started to click i was like okay uh I, I, I'm starting to get this down. Um, spring, obviously, for everybody, it was learn. It was a learning curve. I mean, we were always just out there running around, trying to run fast and do everything fast. But um, I, I think that summer and and the beginning of fall camp that allowed everybody to just like hone in and like take a deep breath. And we we've been in it for 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 a few months now, so let's just let's just take a step back and breathe and let's let's move things out and I, th- I think i think after midway within that first fall camp was when i initially started to get a hold of everything yeah you know, that season was pretty fun actually looking back I, anything would have been fun coming off no wins but you guys looked <laughs> pretty good it was, it was you can show that the team was progressing you know right and we, won, yeah. we were in all the games even the ones we lost we could have won a few of those too Right, and um, I think, like you said at the beginning, like anything would have been better than 2015. I think we were just <laughs> <laughs> we were just happy to get get some W's on the board at that point. And then, um, it's crazy because after the season, after that season, looking back, it was like you were like like you said, like bro, we were we were looking around like we were in all of these games, like we we could be really good, like. <laughs> Like we can we can run the board if if we if we sharpen things out and that's all it took was a little sharpening out because the a key thing that I think would help change the tide was the overall vibe of the team. Um, starting with Frost and his staff, I mean they were they they're so loving and caring, and and it's infectious and I think everyone kind of bought into that and it kind of like just spread. It spread and spread, and everybody. That was the main core of our team. Yeah, we're fast. Yeah, we're athletic. But I think the the biggest thing was the family environment, where we all had each other's back, whether we were down, whether we were up. We all were there for each other. And I think that's what made the difference. Yeah, I don't know what happened there at the end of the season. The tough loss, that Cure Bowl game. <laughs> uh, that, that one kind of is like a head scratcher for me still. Right. Um, looking back at it, like I said. We were we were just happy. At, initially, we were happy to be in in a bowl game coming off of a uh, uh, 0 and 12 season. Like like we were just happy to be in a bowl game. I, for, from an overall team standpoint, we definitely weren't as locked in as we needed to be. Because like I said, it was kind of like nostalgic, like just being there, like in that moment, especially after what we had just went through the previous year. So I think that had a lot to do do with it. We we underestimated um Arkansas State and they and they and they played like they played like it was their national championship. Like they 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 were in a lower lower uh, division than us, but they didn't care about any of that. Like they they seen us as as their as as a great opponent and and we kind of played down to them. How do you think that affected the team? Like, did you think? Getting beat like that kind of sent a message to the team for the next year, and you guys worked even harder now for that. Oh, definitely. That definitely left a sour taste in our mouth. I mean, uh, it was it was ridiculous. It it kind of it kind of gave us a taste of what of what 2015 felt like overall in one year, and but they did it in one game. Like it was just like we can't go back to this. Like this is not. We didn't do all this work just to backtrack and be bad again like in that spring that that following spring you could just feel feel it in the air everybody was so locked in so focused it was it was an aggressive tough spring and like you you could see it all coming together and it was it was amazing yeah and that's that, that 2017 season started off uh and it, it to your point it was it was clear that team was clicking right so 
we had convincing wins against Maryland and Memphis early on, which really set the tone. But for you, for you as a as a player and for the rest of your teammates, was there a point in, in that season early on where you kind of looked around and was like, okay, we can we can really do something special here. Like we got the makings of uh, of a special team here. Was there a moment or, or, or a point where you realized that that was a you know that was in the cards for you guys? I honestly, I think I think it was after Maryland. I mean, the previous year, if you remember, they beat us in overtime. That 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 2016 year, they they beat us in overtime, and 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 that was at our that was at our stadium. So when we went up to their 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 stadium, um, 2017, you know, their big their Big Ten team, they, they were supposed to be one of the better teams on our schedule that year. And I mean, and we went up there and we dominated, and we like it was like like we're we're good guys. Like it's, this is this isn't a fluke. Like it wasn't like it was a nail biter of a game. Like we. We won convincingly, and it just, it just, I kind of, I, I think it kind of opened our eyes to the fact that like we can, we can run the table. Yeah, that game was even close. Like, I mean, you guys dominated yeah. from the start. Was that right. something you guys? It, would you guys talk about it on the bus afterwards on the plane? Were you guys like flying back? Like, damn, like we just, we just, we just took it to them pretty, pretty seriously. And like, and and you know, is that kind of the realization where you all kind of said like, hey, this, this is, this is our thing. This is our year. Well, I, 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 it was, it was more of an unspoken thing. We kind of just were like, we, we, we kind of after that, we kind of had like a swagger to us. It wasn't so much in the words. It was just about how we went about everything after that. It, we just had a different swagger after that win. You could just feel the vibe. Like we didn't, we didn't really talk about like how, how dominant we were. But like, like I said, like you watch our practices after that, or like just, just watch the overall swag of a team. It, it, just, it just gave us so much confidence. Yeah, speaking of special, that running back room, the last few years, you've had you, AK, Otis, McCray, and people forget about Jerron Hamilton. Jerron Hamilton was getting a lot of carries until he got hurt. Right. All- this, right. Um, he was he he was the starting back going into that 2017 season, man. You know, Jerron Hamilton is, is, is like a brother to me, and I, and I – when you brought it up, that's all I thought about was um, him him getting injured in that Maryland game, and you know, um, it, it just sucks, man. Because we had we 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 had a crazy backfield with him. I know we had a good a, a great backfield without him, but like even with him, it was just that much more incredible, man. And um, he's a special talent. So it's just crazy how we had all that talent in the backfield at one time. I I I literally forgot about that. Yeah, how competitive was that in practice every day with you guys? It it brings out it brings out the best in you. You have no choice but to, but but to go out there and compete. I mean, because the thing is, no no one's gonna slack, and if you are slacking, the next person's gonna do something good, and you're gonna be like, hey, uh, I, I can I need to pick it up, or I'm gonna get left in the dust. And I'm I mean that that's the great thing about having all the all those special backs in the backfield. It really. It really made you compete with them and, and with yourself. I mean, you you unlock levels that you never would think you would unlock. I mean, I um you know because those guys are uh, like way smaller than me, but they're 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 real good out the backfield, like routes and everything. And and that 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 just made me work on work on route running and everything that much more because I'm like I, I want I want to be as good as them at, at at out the backfield as they are, and that's just something that push me to be better and every day yeah well so the other thing is i mean you guys all bring you know something different to the table i think that's you know it's kind of rare that the, you all each have a unique skill set and, and it complements each other really well but so let, let's talk quickly about those guys for a second i'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the name of, of one of those guys and you give me the first thing that comes to your mind when i say that person's name right okay so let's start with right. let's start with ak what about adrian killens what comes to mind when i say adrian killens burner can't catch him if he, if he gets past you it's over well, let me ask you a question real quick, Todd. Just me and you talking here, Tosh. Uh, Hypel okay. seems to run him up the middle a lot. What is that? Is that schematic, or is that just part of of his scheme? It, it would seem like he'd be better on the outside, but he seems to get a lot of runs in between the tackles. Is that just part of the the Hypel offense? Yeah, I mean that that that's that's the offense. I mean, if you if you watch go, even go back to to Missouri, we watch a lot of Missouri tape. That that's the bread and butter of the offense, the power inside zone schemes, man, and um, the it's. It's kind of tough when you know you you got you gotta you gotta give him those carries because if he sees a seam, it's over with, and 
you know, um, that was our first year in the offense. So obviously I think they're going to expand more, but yeah, for the most part, that's the bread and butter of the offense. I mean, that's, that's, that's just what it was, man. And, um, I think I think they were getting used to us. We were getting used to them, and um, you know, um, just just how 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 he felt like how he feels like he needs to incorporate us in his offense going into year two. I'm pretty sure they're gonna open it up more, and I'm pretty sure they looked at that. And I mean, you know, either way, I know AK made it work. I mean, you know, he's a great player, and you're right. He's definitely he's definitely uh diverse um on the outside as well. Like that that that's really where you want him to get the ball at, but. Like I said, that that's the bread and butter of the offense. But I'm I'm almost pos- certain that, you know, going into year two, they'll they'll definitely find more ways to get AK on the outside more. Well, speaking of diverse, how about this guy, Otis Anderson? That's a that's a Swiss Army knife, man. He he, he can get you all all three phases of the game: running, catching, and and uh, returning. Man, that, that's 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 my boy right there. Um, like he's like I said, he's he just Three dimensional. I mean, like if you if you got him out if you got him in the backfield, boom, he he gets out in the slot. You put a backer on him, it's over with. Like that's not fair game. You need even DBs can't even stick him. And then um you get him in the punt return game, and it's like he's a cheat code. I mean he his cuts are so he has great cuts, great vision, man. And um he, he he's a really special player. Yeah. What are the, do you think? Uh, so he spent a lot of time at receiver this past season, obviously. Um, do, do you think he'll, sp- he'll spend more time on the outside, or do you think they'll find ways to get him back in the backfield this year? Um, uh, I, I, th- I think he'll definitely be in the backfield more this year, but um, as we stated earlier, with, with all the talent we have in that room, it, at, at some point you just want to get as much of it on the field as possible. So if you can have A.K. Greg or Ben at running back and have him in the slot, I, it, it just gives you that much more of diversity in the game and it makes the defense have the game plan more, but I definitely feel like he'll, he'll be, he'll be in the backfield a lot more this season. Well, you mentioned the next guy. I mean, this guy exploded last year. I mean, he was just, uh, he was on fire really the second half of the season. Um, uh, tell us about Greg McCray. Mm, that's a technician right there, man. Smooth. Uh, he, he's one of those dudes. He does everything right, man. And he's decisively strong. Um, you know, you, you look at him, he's like one, a buck 70, a buck 80, but when, when he, he, he has power to him he's, and he's not scared, of, he's not scared to block. He's not scared to run into people. And he, he just, he just does everything right, man. He's, he's a hard worker. And like I said, those are, these are all my brothers, man. And like he, he, he's a, he's a perfectionist. If he doesn't get it right, it, it, it sits, it sits on his mind all, all day. Like if he messes up in practice. It could be one mess up, and he has a great day. I see him after practice, and then I'm looking in his face, and I'm like, "What's wrong, bro?" And he's like, "I had a bad day uh, off of one play. He could, he could have killed the rest of practice, but that one play in, in his head it registers as a bad practice." And um, you know, those are the type of dudes you want. I mean, like they 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 want to do everything right, and that's the type of dude Greg is. Hey, Taj, how does it affect you as a running back, like splitting carries with all these guys? Do you like to get into a rhythm? Do you like to get like twenty carries? I mean, I mean, I mean, um, you know, traditionally, I, I, every running back would, you know, would 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 like to, would like to get into a rhythm, get a lot of carries, you know, just just because that's the nature of of being a running back. You know, the more carries you get, the more rhythm you get into, and you know, the the better you are, you get better as the game goes on. But I think what's really unique with 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 our offense was the fact that you know. In the backfield, we were all brothers. Like we all had each other's backs, and and we we thrived off seeing each other do good. So if I wasn't in the game, and AK Greg Otis, whoever was in, you know, like watching them do good, like whoever was not in, it made us feel good. So when we went in, we're we're trying to we're trying to outdo them. So when they get in, they can try to outdo us. I mean, that's the thing about our backfield, which I feel like it, it's it's not like that across the country, man. We're we're really unselfish in that backfield man because because we're so close we like to see us we like to see each other prosper and you know but like i said traditionally every every running back would like to get into a rhythm but like i said man when you have this many this many good backs in the backfield i mean uh it's it's tough it's tough it's tough man it's tough but but i mean i think we made it better we made it better for each other to deal with because of how close we were and how, and how excited we got to see each other succeed. 
Yeah, and you probably had some fresh legs there in the fourth quarter too, since you were, you know, you yeah, had like you can you there's the, you, the a defense can't prepare for all of all of us, man, because if one's tired and and someone else gets in, it's not a fall off. Like it's it's just the same. You you're getting the same thing coming at you, so you're tired and we're not, and it's it's, it's honestly not fair. All right, so take us to the Peach Bowl. That whole day, where were all your emotions going through you that day? I I was there, man. It was great. It was unbelievable. I never imagined a day like that. It, it was it was surreal, man. It was it was a surreal moment. We, we were we we were we were focused, but we were relaxed and we were enjoying it. I mean, um, flashback to um 2016, our first when in the Cure Bowl, it was it was more just enjoy enjoying excitement just to be there. And when we got to the Peach Bowl that following year, it was more we. We were relaxed, but we were focused. Like we, we were so dialed in, but we didn't let it. We we didn't let that focus. We didn't let that focus attention deter us from having fun on the trip. And you know, we got the best of both ends. Like we had fun, but when it was time to lock in, we we were totally focused, man. And it was it was just a fun experience. So what, uh, after the game, you guys are on the field. You're celebrating. You know, the trophy's going up. You guys are having a good time. And, uh, and, and what you guys probably didn't know at the time was Danny White was looking at a camera somewhere and declared you guys national <laughs> champs, right? So when did, yes, you, when did you guys find out about what he had said and kind of what was going on and, and uh, that he intended to celebrate you guys as national champions? And, and what, were your, what was the team's overall thoughts when, when you figured that out? I mean, um, obviously, like you said, we were kind of starstruck, starstruck in the moment. We didn't, we, didn't even, we didn't know where he was. We were all just basically – Flying around the field, going crazy, and I think I think it really hit us. We when we when we got showered and we got on the bus and we went back to the hotel, and then you know we get on Twitter and and, and we see we see it blowing up. And um, from an overall team standpoint, it it made us feel good that that our that our AD had our back, man. Like because that whole season we were going, we went undefeated and we didn't even get an opportunity to. So hoist the national championship trophy or play for it or anything, get into the playoffs, nothing. And, you know, that kind of that that kind of stuck with us. And the fact that he was willing to stick, st- stick his arm out for us and and say that and basically let let the world know that he he's behind us 100 percent. That it, it made us feel good and it made us respect him that much more, honestly. All right. So going into your senior year now. You guys are still undefeated, but now another coaching change. Hypo comes in. What right. was your first impression of him, and when you got a chance to be around him, what, when you understood what he wanted to do? My first impression of him was he he's a, he's a genuine guy, man. Um, and the thing about the thing about Coach Hype it was he 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 came into a different situation. You know, most most coaching changes happen because a coach is doing bad. You know, so for him to come in and have to take over an undefeated team, you know, that's that's a lot on him because it's 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 hard to make changes. It's hard to, you know, implement your plan on a team that was so successful. And I think I think he I think he handled it extremely well. I'm mean, you know, um that I think he did well was he, he asked our opinion on a lot of things. He didn't just take it upon himself. He didn't just come in and you know, put his foot down and this is you you're gonna do it this way or the highway. No, he kinda he kinda nurtured us and was like, Do you would you guys like this? How do you feel about that? And I, th- I that made us respect him even more from the jump because we kind of felt like, all right, we have a voice and he's listening to us. And that made us feel good. I mean, you know, he listened to our concerns and the whole staff was like that. You know, um coming coming in and taking over an undefeated team it, it, and obviously, those those guys are taking over. They're used to success, so for you to come in and try to implement your plan, that, and they're and for mo- and most of our heads at, before he got there, it's like, what? Is, how is he going to change anything? Like, what is there to change? But you know, the fact that he allowed us to be a part of the process and have have a voice and and the overall aspect of everything that that just it it just shows the type of dude he is, man. But as a running back, how did your role change with Hypo in there? Um, I honestly, 
you know, the the the, uh, the main difference between F- Coach Frost's offense and Coach Hype's offense, because because they're very similar. Um, like I, it, uh, it was it was in in Coach Hype's, it's just more inside zone and he, and more power. And honestly, that that's kind of my bread and butter. So, if anything, it kind of it kind of made me more comfortable being back in that type of environment. You know, being back in the you get it and hit it. You know, inside power, it was more of that. And honestly, um, it kind of, it kind of fell into what I was already, the type of person, the type of running back I already was. You know, a one cut downhill runner. And it, it kind of, it wasn't, it wasn't a hard transition, and it, it wasn't a lot of thought that I had to put into it. Honestly, hey, your average doubled this year. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, those, how about? Having all those receivers spread out wide, how much does that help you? Does man, it open split, things up for you? The splits are ridiculous, man. Um, the crazy thing is we noticed it in the, that spring. Um, when, when we broke past the first level, it was almost like nobody was there because the splits were so wide, it was hard for DBs and nickelbacks and outside linebacks. It was hard for them to get there because we're, we're spread out four wide, and, and their, their splits are crazy ridiculous. So – there's most of the time it was one linebacker in the box. So if you get past him, it's like, whoa. And I think that was the craziest thing for us as running backs to see, like, bro, like these splits are going to help us out. It's, it's going to be hard for defenders to get to us. And my, if they do get us, we're 20 yards downfield or if they, or we're in the end zone. Like that's, that, that was, that's the incredible thing about this offense, man. All right. So we have to talk about the play, Taj. Let me, let me set this up. Right. It's October. It's October thirteenth. Uh, UCF's at Memphis or at Memphis, Tennessee. It's fourth and one. We're on our own twenty nine. We're down thirteen points. We call it. We call a timeout. Y'all go to the sideline. And so let's start here. When did you realize that hype was seriously considering going for it on fourth and one? Honestly, I. <laughs> well, all right. Before we before we call that timeout, we went out there. Boom. We went out there and boom, and I knew I, I knew I knew we weren't gonna run it at that moment. We were just trying to get them to jump, and they didn't jump. But in in the back of my mind, I wanted him I wanted him to run it that first time. But I'm like, nah, he's just trying to see if they jump. So they didn't jump. So he called the timeout. So I'm like, dang, all right, we're gonna punt it now. Like it was, we're gonna punt it. So we get to the sideline, and he's like. What do y'all want to do? And I'm like, oh, he, oh, we, we, we get to implement on this. And you know, the old line, everybody's like, let's do it. Like we got it. And I'm like, yeah, let's do it, man. We got it. And he, and he's looking around at the coaches and, and you know, the coaches hear us saying it and they're, they're not in agreement. Like, Hey, they, they, they saying it. So let's do it. And he's like, all right, let's go bones. And I'm like, oh, snap. <laughs> All right, so, 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 bone, bone is the formation. Do you, what was was there actual play call, or was it just? Did you guys just know what it was just based off him saying, "Let's go, bone"? Uh, it's the play, the the formation is bone. The play call is truck. But, but <laughs> we uh we kind of we kind of get to the line and we look over at him, and we can either go belly or truck. Now belly is when Tristan Hill gets it of the gut. Bone, I mean truck is when I get it. So we get to the line, boom, Kenzie, Kenzie gives the hut, whatever, boom. Then we look over, and I'm like, I just know he's going to call Belly. He's going to give it to Tristan because it's one yard. I mean, like, he's going to give it to Tristan right here. I think Tristan can get one yard. And he goes, truck. <laughs> and I'm like, let's go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, and then at that point, I grab it, and I'm I'm – my, I was already predetermined in my head that when I got it, I'm I'm leaping, I'm 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 jumping through the line like I'm get I can no one's gonna stop me from getting a yard, and it's so funny because when I got it and I jumped through the line, I'm like no one touched me like am I still <laughs> up? Okay, and then I see Tristan clobber a dude, and I'm like, oh this is a house call, <laughs> no one else back here, <laughs> and it, it, it was like it was like a kid in a candy store, man. It's like. That, and it was it was so it was such a surreal moment like the the atmosphere off from that play on was crazy man it was 
it was the greatest moment of my of my UCF football career as a player. I mean, just to be in that moment, just to help your team get a W on your own 29-yard line. I mean, just to know your coach has that type of faith in you as a team and you as a – and us as a – as a um, team, I mean that it just it just made it just made it so much feel so much better, man. Had you guys did you guys ever practice that play or is that did you guys ever run that play uh, in a game before uh, before the Memphis game? Um, I think we ran we ran we ran um we might have ran it one time we ran a truck one time before and we ran Belly the one with Tristan and he scored on it. Yeah. So, but we pra- we practice it we practice it once a week. On Friday, I mean, on Thursday or Friday before the game, we practice it one time a week, and it's over with. I mean, it's not it's not something like we we do all the time. I mean, it's it's a it's a once a week type of thing, you know. If it, it's a last resort type of thing, and and it, it had so happened to be last resort at that moment. All right. So for those of us who will never understand this, when when you break away like that. Like, is, is that the longest run of your life? Are you just, like, looking over your shoulder? Do you get tired halfway through? Like, take us through, like, when you know that you're all alone. Like, is your, is your biggest fear getting tired or someone chasing you down? Um, <laughs> I, as, a, as, a, as somebody getting the ball in that much space, obviously anyone's biggest fear is getting run down, unless you're AK. <laughs> but, um... To be honest with you, I was I was fully confident. I mean, throughout throughout my life, I I can't I can't say I've I've been run down from behind. So, and just to be in that situation, that that is a fear in the back of your head. And and most people, you know, they try to look at like the the, the jumbos trying to see like where the people are behind them while they're running. But I I was just looking at the end zone, man, because I knew if I if I ran straight, I was fine. But yeah, definitely. I, and the thing is, I knew if I got caught, AK, Otis, Greg, Ben, they wouldn't let me live that down. <laughs> like if I got, if I got hogged in, I would have to live with that for the rest of my life. Not even from fans, just from from people in my room, because that's how competitive we are. So I think I think that's what really motivated me to to, to get here and get to this zone because I'm like, if I don't score, I would never hit the end of this. Yeah, I mean, that, look, that, that's that's the biggest play of the season, like in my opinion, like that. That runs the the single biggest play of the season. That propels us where we are. So, uh, it, you mentioned earlier, man, but it's it's one of those most I- iconic plays uh, in UCF history. That they'll, they'll be playing that play for years, uh, and uh, uh, it, it certainly I think was a uh, was a was a huge moment uh, in our, our 2018 season for sure. Yeah, man, I was happy to be a part of it. <laughs> yeah, man, dude. If we don't even get that first down, I mean, you, you said we're down 13. That's like late in the third quarter already when that happened yeah yeah i mean it's like it's if raining we, <laughs> if we if we don't convert the game is essentially over because they're in position to at least get a field goal or a touchdown right and it's like it you know god god worked in our worked in our favor man all right well yeah 25 straight over two years with two different coaching staffs with all the you know the playoff snubs and stuff, the idiots in the media. What were your emotions after the loss? Finally, when we finally lost the game, <laughs> the final, the final game. Oh <laughs> man, it was, it was a roller coaster, man. At first, it was like, it was, it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. We hadn't lost it so long, man. I, I forgot how it felt like, and uh, it was, it was a bad feeling, man, because. You know, I, I went in, I, you know, I went in losing, and I want, I, I didn't want to go out like that, man. And um, it was, it was, it was just a, an intense moment for a lot of us, man. It's, it, it, me especially. Um, you know, but then after, you know, after I got in the locker room and I, you know, I showered, and then you just sitting there thinking, it's like. All that pressure that was, everybody everybody wanted us to lose, man, and um, it's it's just, it's just it felt like weight lifted off our lifted off my shoulders, like off our shoulders. It's like we we know how it feels again, you know. Now now back now back to square one, you know. Let's 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 try to run the tables again, but just to just to get that feeling again of a loss, it it, it, it was it was an intense moment, man. Honestly. Yeah, how do you feel about the team coming back now this year? Did you go to the spring game yesterday? Oh yeah, I definitely was there, and um, I I, I feel good about them, man. Um, they got 
I, I'm, I'm going to reference what Trey Nell said in a video I seen. They got too many weapons, honestly. Like, it's not fair. Um, I, I don't I don't see as a as a opposing head coach, I don't see how you'll be able to game plan for everybody, man. It's just not it's not possible. You can't stop Gabe and Trey and Otis and Marlon and AK and Greg and Ben. Like <laughs> come on, man. Like and and, and we we have a all all of our quarterbacks are, are great. I mean, um they all have potential to, to to be to be great. So it's not like I don't know, man. I don't. I I just think they're 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 running the tables again. And then on defense, man, we got we got the we got the best safety in the nation. We got two of the best corners in the nation. You know, we got a, we got a great stable of linebackers led by Nate. I'm um, great D line led by B Hayes, man. I don't know, man. I think I I think I think it'll 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 be another great season, honestly. Undefeated again, right? That's that's the plan, you know. I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to put any pressure on the guys. <laughs> but that's I mean, the new standard around here, right? They might as well, yeah. You might as well say that. I mean, any, anything less is a, is a, is a disappointment, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, you know, uh, normal teams, you know, they want to win nine, ten games, man. But uh, in in our in our family, man, that that's not that's not the standard. Yeah. So you've been preparing for the draft. Yeah, man, it's been a it's been a grind these past three four months. I mean, it's just just constant workouts, talking to teams, visiting. You know, it's just it's just it's an intense. You know, now now it's, it's basically after pro day, it's, it's like you're stuck between where am I going and what am I gonna do. Like it's it's this is the this is a terrible time right now, honestly, because you're in the land of unknown because no one knows where they're going, man. It's it just it just gives you a lot to think about. You just you just your mind's everywhere. Do you get any feedback from teams? You t- you've been talking to teams. You say, no, I yeah, that, um, some interest. Yeah, um, a lot of a lot of teams were very impressed with my pro day, and um, I actually I've been talking. Um, I actually just came back from the Bucks. Um, on Saturday I had a visit, and then um, I'm going up to Jacksonville for a visit on Tuesday. But um, yeah, I've been talking to a lot of teams uh, over the phone, just doing interviews. You know, they come they've been coming down, working me out, man. And um, it's, it's just, it's just, it's a, it's a lot to take in. I'm just That'd happy. That'd be cool, huh? Stay, one of the Florida teams? Uh, the Bucks and the Jags. Yeah, yeah I, I think that'd be cool to stay down here in Florida, right? Oh yeah, it would just, it, it would, it would be great. Like I said, um, like I said earlier, another opportunity to, for my family to watch me potentially play, man. Um, that, you're that, a Dolphin that, fan that, though, from down here? Huh? You're a Dolphin fan living down here? The crazy thing is, I wasn't. <laughs> no. I, I, my, I was the I was a fan of their arch rival, the Patriots, only because everyone liked the Dolphins, and I just did not want to be like all my other family. <laughs> like I wanted, I wanted to play devil's advocate. I wanted to, I wanted to stir the pot, and I, and I just became a Patriots fan since I was young, man, because because I knew everyone would would hate me for it, and I just liked it. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, Taj, well, we appreciate your time. We're going to get you out of here. At the end of every show or interview, we do uh, we do 10 questions, and we do 10 kind of random uh, questions that could be about sports, could be about UCF, could be about anything. So uh, so we got we got 10 hot, fresh questions for you, man. Are you ready to face these 10 random, uh, you never know what you're going to get questions? Let's get it. All right, so we had Wyatt Miller on the show a while back, and uh, he told us he was a great karaoke singer. We tried that out. It didn't go so well. Uh, I don't know that I would say he's great, but um, which of, <laughs> which of your other teammates has a hidden talent that nobody else knows about? because uh, I can oh, tell you, I, it's I, not it's not Wyatt in uh, it's not Wyatt in uh, karaoke. So there's a there's a correct answer to this. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer. So it's up to you. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a oh, great question. Oh yeah, all right, it's on me. But yeah, um. I gotta go with a running back, man. There's a there's a freshman running back in our room named Trillion Coles, uh, and he 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 can he can play any instrument. He raps, he sings, he dances. He's an actual overall like jack of all trades, honestly, and it's, it's very impressive. He plays the piano, the drums. You know, he can he can freestyle. He and but no one knows obviously because he's he's a bit of an unknown right now with all those running backs. But be on the lookout for him, man. He's gonna be great. Yeah, he had a he had a big spring game, and he had some good carries. And I just figured out he was uh, his his dad's Lavernius Coles. Yep. 
That's pretty. Um, he, he, he's he, he's going to be a good one down the line, man. Once once he gets his chance, he he's going to be good. Taj, your name Taj. Is that short for anything, or that's just your name? T A J. Three letters. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a story behind that? Your mom just liked it, or what? Oh, my mom. My mom let my mom lets um. Like family members pick our names, and I just so happy my aunt just um actually my godmom she just she landed on Taj Taj Mahal because because of the she liked the Taj Mahal. So that's <laughs> okay, a, it's as simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. It's unique. I've never met anybody else named Taj. Yeah, I like it. I like it. I mean, I don't have a choice, obviously. <laughs> but <laughs> it's <just going> on. <laughs> All right, Taj, tell us. Uh, give us this one. What's a movie? That makes you cry every time you watch it. A movie that makes me cry. Oh man. Um I'm gonna have to go with Dang, a movie that makes me cry. Sheesh. Um I can give you one of mine real quick while you think so. Um every time, um remember the Titans. That one gets me every time after the guy gets in the oh, accident. Let's go. Yeah. Every time it gets me. Remember the Titans. I'm with you on that one, man. Uh, especially me being a football player, man. It's just like in your head, you're you're in the movie with these guys. And yeah, all right, I'm I'm with you on remember the Titans. Yeah, the, the, and uh, Co- Coach Carter, Coach Carter also does it to me too, even though I don't play basketball. <laughs> <laughs> it's just sports. And that, that those tragic moments in those movies, man, it just it hurts. I understand. I I, I can end up cried a few times too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're obviously not a Game of Thrones fan, right? Because a big season premiere is going on while we're taping this. Yeah, no, nah, I've never watched the show. Me either. So what is your favorite show? Like, what if there were, your show is on tonight? What could we not do the interview because you had to watch what show? My favorite show. Of all time is a show I don't know if a lot of people know about it. It's called Psych. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I never actually yeah. I've seen maybe a couple episodes here and there, but yeah, I know what you're yeah, talking about. That is my favorite show because I'm a big mystery uh I'm a big mystery guy and like uh or like um you like crime, stuff like that. And and this show they kinda intertwine crime, mystery and comedy. And I'm, I'm, I was, my mom, my mom started watching it when I was younger and I got stuck with it because she watched it. And that, that's my favorite show. I mean, I, I go in the house, I don't even watch regular TV because it, they, they, their, their last season's already over with. So I just, I just, I just watch it on, uh, Amazon Prime, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's all I watch, man. All right, there's a there's a new trend going on right now, uh, Taj. There's a, there's a song out called Old Old Town Road by Lil Nas X. All right, so by by the laughing, I've, you've heard of this song, yes? Uh, so oh, you, you have no choice. Is is it a good song or not? I don't know. I can't tell. Is it a good song or not? I believe it is a good song, and I believe the remix with Billy Ray Cyrus makes it an even better song. Okay. Because I feel like that song brings brings everyone together i mean if you're a hip-hop fan if you're a country fan whatever you like i mean that's that song it just it it, it just feels right to me it feels right yeah, you, i get a good vibe and then that was the original then when i heard billy ray cyrus on the remix i was like man and he killed he killed it he killed it so i just that is a great song man and i but i feel like it's gonna get played out really yeah. really fast well, that's that's the trick in the music industry, right? You you make a remix and you make one hit record into two, right? So that's that's the trick right. in the music industry. So they they, they definitely right. figured that part out. Right. They definitely extended the yeah. the, the life of it. <laughs> For sure. Who is your favorite running back to watch in the NFL? AP all day. Yeah, just the way he runs so hard, right? Yep. Yeah, I'm a big AP fan, man. He runs so violent and with so much aggression. And, um, you know, he's very consistent. And, you know, he's one of the best backs to ever play the game. All right, so you, you – uh, model yourself against, uh, after him, right? Huh? You try to model your game after his? Definitely, definitely, man. I, you know, uh, that's – when I'm when I'm not watching Psych, obviously, uh, that's <laughs> – I'm, I'm, I'm watching film from him, man, because he, he – he, he he's done it at such a high level for such a long time. You know, you just want you just want to be like that. 
All right, Tosh. So, uh, truth or dare time for you here. Ready? So, you guys have run, run the read option pretty much the last three years, right? So, for those who don't know, the read option, the the quarterback will kind of stick the ball in your belly, and then he's got the decision at the last second if he wants to pull it out and uh, and and throw it or run it, or if he wants to keep it with you, right? Has there ever right. been a time where you stole the ball, where you just even though it was in your belly and you knew you weren't supposed to, that you just you saw something and you just you snatched it up and took it anyway? <laughs> Um, actually that, that, yeah, that's happened a few times. Um, is it, the thing is, it's, it's so, it's so hard because sometimes they, their read is, is there and our read is there, but obviously if my hands are around the ball and I see something, I'm going to yank it. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, you, it, it's sometimes it's just something you see, you just can't pass up. And then, um, um, yeah, I mean, honestly, it's happened a few times. I remember uh, my, my sophomore year, we were in fall camp, actually, and, um, it, this is when we, back when Justin Holmes was, was the quarterback, and, um, it, we were on, like, our own 40, and it was, it was a read option, obviously, and he, he, ha- he stuck it in my belly, and before he, I didn't even give him a chance to read his key, I grabbed it, and I, and I took off, and I scored and uh, when I got to the sideline, he was like, "Bro, like, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you scored, but let me get to my read first. <laughs> and I was like, "Man, I apologize, but man, yeah, uh, that that's something that happens a lot." All right, the NBA playoffs are underway. Right. Who's gonna win it all now? Oh, Golden State again? The Warriors. You think they got the it again? Gonna... Huh? It's gonna be them again. Yeah, they yeah, they're gonna do it again. Uh the only, yeah, they're gonna do it again. I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I can't see anybody else beating them, man. They 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 got too much talent. Yeah, they were, they were pretty solid last night. So, uh so you played uh one season 2015 with George O'Leary as your head coach. And so uh actually Justin Holman of all people on our, on our previous show let it slip to us that uh, as players um, you all had the, a secret nickname for Coach O'Leary, and it was the it was the White Horse, right? So, a, were you in on the White Horse? Were you aware of that? And then, b, do you have any idea where that started from? When I was aware of the White Horse, a, b, I have no idea where it came from because that that was established way before I got there. So, and for me to only have one season with that, knowing that, I didn't have a lot of time to to investigate. <laughs> so, you you yeah, said you were in a mystery, Taj. I figured you had this figured out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I need I needed a little bit more time to gather information, but I did I didn't get it, man. Sadly, but um, yeah, I've heard I've heard it, definitely heard it my, that that season, but I have no idea where it came from. So, how does that work when you're a young guy? Does does one of the older guys come up to you and go, "Hey, look, look here, Rook. Here's the deal." Whenever GOL's in the building, we're going to say white horse and you need to do like, how, how does someone come up to you and, and tell you about what that means and what you're supposed to do? It was more, it was more like the older guys were, would see him or like, we're talking about him and they would use that reference and you just overheard and were like, Hey, who are y'all talking about? <laughs> and they were like, that's what we're talking about. Coach O'Leary. And then you're just like, Oh, okay. And it's that. It, then no one comes up to you and tells you it personally. It's <laughs> over here from others. <laughs> I think we've kind of narrowed it down. I think it started somewhere around 2009, 2010. Right. Yeah. It, it's way before I got there. Because we asked Joe Burnett and he graduated in 2007. And he hadn't heard of it yet. I mean, he was 2008, 2008. Sorry. So it had to be right after him. Yeah. And Holman, yeah. Holman didn't know where it started either. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I wish I wish I knew the, the, the original white horse contributor so we could, so I could get the, <laughs> We're going to figure it out. Right. It's our job this summer to figure it out. <laughs> no doubt. All right. So you changed your number before, right? You were number 12. Now you're number four. Is there any reason for that? Or is there a number you like better? Um, honestly, being, being, being from, being from uh, South Florida, um, low, low numbers, just it, that that's just who we were. Like if you were a player, I I know it might it might not it's it's really not nothing in the grand scheme of things but like just just growing up you know always having little numbers especially like um you know growing up if you had a low number that meant you were like one of the the players on the team you know all the way leading up to high school I wore number two and then um that the crazy thing is Trey left Trey left that season beforehand before my senior season and I was like 
Man, I I I wanna I wanna end my senior season, you know, like how, with the number I was gonna get a low number regardless, but I was like, um, you know, no better number to get than than get trades. And man, he was my roommate for for two years before that and I just I it just felt felt right. Well you certainly wore it well, Taj, and uh again you uh you brought uh, you brought the most uh, iconic play of 2018 to the team, and uh, probably one of the most iconic plays we'll see in UCF history. And not only that, man, you represent UCF really well through your four years there. Uh, you were a team player. You you were part of ups and downs. You, you stuck with the program, uh, national champion, and uh, and you went out. Uh, you know, 25 wins in 26 games, man. Uh, certainly a great run of uh, of a career at UCF, man. So we appreciate everything you did for the program, and uh, we certainly thank you for joining us tonight on the show. I appreciate you, man. Thank you for having me. Hey, Taj, man. Good luck with the drafts and everything and your career coming up and whatever you do. I know, I'm know i sure you're going to be successful, man. You sound like a great young man. And thanks for doing the interview with us, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate that, man. And I appreciate the work you guys do and, and giving us a, another voice, man. It's, it's great. Awesome. Let's go, hey, so what, one last thing. So you guys have actually – have you talked to the other guys that we've talked to? Like Wyatt and uh, uh, Joey Connors and those guys? Yeah, I talk, I actually talked to Wyatt and I talked to uh, Rashard re- as of recently. Yeah. Oh yeah, Rashard. Yeah. <laughs> Rashard was funny too, man. His reaction to the white horse thing cracked me up. <laughs> right. Yeah, man. I, I I I had talked to those guys about it, man. Everyone thinks you guys are great, man. And I, after this conversation, I, I know you guys are great. I just appreciate you guys putting your time on the line for us. Well, see, just when I couldn't like you anymore, Taj, now I like you even better, buddy. Uh, but, <laughs> but no, man, good, best of luck to you, man, and, uh, and charge on. Thank you, man. Charge on. Good night. All right, thanks again for listening in to the Sunday Conversation brought to you by the Sons of UCF Podcast. Make sure you find us wherever you get your high-quality podcasts, and don't forget to follow us on social media. Until we talk next time, everybody have a fantastic day. Sons of UCF signing off. Go Knights. Charge on.